Est-ce que vous pouvez, euh, à propos des nouveaux réalistes, nous replonger dans le contexte so, des années 60 et nous, euh, nous amener comme ça à, à comprendre uh, par cette ambiance des années 60 uh, ce qui vous a amené à constituer ce groupe et surtout à le détecter Vous avez raison de poser cette question parce que je pense qu'il y a colore de son réseau de toutes les entreprises. Le nouveau réseau est intéressant aussi par sa préhistoire et par sa préhistoire régulière. C'est-à-dire uh, uh, la seconde moitié des années 50 avant uh, la constitution of this artistic group, the 1950s, before uh, the creation of the group, uh, well, this is something that must be uh, Paris, considered as well. Alors, cette In October 1960, Paris, uh, uh, this group was formed, and the period before the 1950s is uh, très différente a period which is typical Uh, well known for its uh, precise uh, approach to art, to which was quite uh, different from what happened later on and what later turned into the ensuite, current uh, artistic, uh, contemporary artistic scene. The uh, scene uh, at first had a sense of uh, anxiety or uh, disillusion and uh, et c'est une irrésistible ascension qui se produit après la guerre. L'étonnant de l'école de Paris, c'est une grande galerie qui tient en quelque sorte le destin de l'art contemporain, entre leurs mains, ont choisi une stratégie suicidaire, celle justement d'ignorer New York et de faire en sorte que tout of, se passe uh, après la guerre comme avant la guerre. Dans l'immunité de New York et ils essaient de garder les choses dans le même temps après la guerre comme ça avait été avant la guerre. Or, ce n'est pas vrai. Mais Paris, uh, il est certain was, uh, trying que to, uh, make, uh, la résistance à New York s'organise de façon systématique. Paris to, uh, On peut parler d'une véritable mafia de la guerre. Elle s'appelle la Galerie de France. Elle s'appelle la Galerie de France. Elle s'appelle la Galerie de France. La galerie de service, en quelque sorte, qui est aujourd'hui, qui était dirigée par Massenta et qui était la galerie which was then directed by Massent and which does not even exist anymore and which back then uh, was uh, sort of uh, the, the divining, the divining force uh, behind uh, the Paris school. So this Paris school uh, really uh, sort of tried to stand up against the uh, Trojan horse of the New York school, against this abstract socialism, so to speak. So in order to fight against this, the Paris school Uh, decided to fight by using cubism because this was something which originated in Paris before the war and they hoped that through this abstraction they would be able to solve these problems. But of course, um, the result was catastrophic in the 1960s. This war uh, really started between uh, Paris and New York as regards uh, who gained power over whom and also as regards the uh, contemporary art. Market. In 1964, we had this award which was uh, this prize which was awarded in Europe and especially in Paris, and suddenly we found ourselves in a situation where the artistic power of the New York School kept gaining more and more power. So basically, you supported these artists, you gave them courage uh, so that through their art and through their artworks, uh, they can uh, assert themselves. Themselves. It was really incredible what uh, what what they were doing. Could you explain some uh, somehow what was going on? Yes, uh, starting in 1959, I used to travel uh, with the artists uh, quite a uh, lot to the Paris uh, Railway Company, or uh, no, no, rather to the uh, to the. De compresser uh, les de carrosses et de voitures et de les normaliser. Les steel workers, uh, to different uh, artisans, uh, were 
Prismatic, they used to uh, try to uh, use their art, and Sivan, who was uh, fascinated uh, by this art, uh, he really uh, sort of engaged in all of this as if it was completely new. And while we were waiting uh, for him in 1960 during a salon, during an exhibition, he submitted uh, a very uh, unique and uh, no, special uh, artwork uh, which uh, he sort of uh, uh, molded uh, from uh, different uh, parts of iron, of steel. It was like a metal cube uh, which was made of uh, different uh, metal materials. Uh, he thought it was very uh, beautiful, but we uh, really uh, opposed this uh, uh, choice of uh, his uh, because at uh, that time uh, he really sort of lost uh, his uh, artistic uh, uh, collectioners uh, by making this uh, work of art uh, and he remained uh, completely isolated but uh, even so he was uh, he remained convinced of his uh, direction but this uh, art this type of art, which uh, was uh, already then uh, accepted, and uh, the fact that he managed to get into new uh, realism, well, this sort of made a, a, a road or the journey uh, somewhat uh, less difficult for us. He uh, was. Uh, uh, he was uh, at first quite uh, marginalized, and uh, a number of artists who decided to accept this philosophy of things, uh, they accepted the preeminence of this uh, step of his, of this uh, work of art by him. So this really uh, helped us uh, to come together as a group, and uh, several months afterwards, several days, in fact, after uh, this happened, we created uh, Yves Klein and others, uh, the so-called uh, new realism, uh, realism nouveau. Uh, well, it was Armand first of all, uh, Yves Klein and Marcel. Uh, who uh, we're at the beginning of this movement, and then uh, poster makers who joined us uh, later on. This uh, art also uh, became part of it, uh, Christo Meschon and others uh, joined uh, later on. So you said that this was quite a unique uh, opportunity to... Uh, to really live uh, in this uh, period of time when uh, new realism was being formed. Yes, that is uh, indeed uh, very true. In uh, February 1960, this was pretty much the period of time we are talking about. And um, uh, later on, after the manifest in fact in 1961, I think it was the 12th of February, if I remember uh, well, uh, his wife, uh, who then uh, lived already with him, he call, she called me, she told me to come over to visit them and uh, to participate in the first uh, event which uh, uh, sort of uh, was an opportunity to also meet others, uh, other sculptors and so on. So this uh, gesture uh, I thought was quite uh, close uh, to the work of collage artists from the Paris school and I was uh, trying to also include uh, uh, there a radical gesture in a philosophical manner which enabled us to create new realism. Thank you very much. Yes, just a few Hi everyone, just just a few words. Et peut-être je vais le, le dire en, en français pour pour simplifier pour pour les traducteurs et vous aurez un, un meilleur anglais. Euh, donc okay, so euh, je voudrais vous donner un peu de contexte. D'abord, vous dire que 
ce moment de vidéo que vous venez de voir était un, un de ces moments privilégiés qui nous est donné de, de vivre dans un parcours professionnel puisque j'avais bien sûr commencé à, à apprendre les nouveaux réalistes dans les livres de Pierre Estany bien avant de le rencontrer. J'étais fasciné par ce qu'il écrivait et ce que je découvrais dans ses livres. Et bien sûr, c'était extrêmet fort de, 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 de le rencontrer et d'ensuite lui poser ses questions. Lui poser ses questions dans l'interview que vous venez de voir, dans en fait le cadre d'une émission de télévision qui était diffusée live sur Internet, c'était au moment de la bulle Internet. L'enregistrement que vous venez de voir a été enregistré en 1999 et donc c'était un signe de l'ouverture d'esprit de Pierre Estany que de vouloir être présent sur ce terrain des nouvelles technologies qu'il qu défendait aussi dans l'art en défendant notamment la vidéo, l'art numérique dont il avait conscience que cela allait devenir une part importante de la création contemporaine. C'est quelqu'un qui me semble, avec son côté, son, son, son apparence physique particulièrement charismatique et, et qui avait comme ça le, un côté oracle hein, et les yeux fermés, c'est presque l'oracle aveugle, le devin qui va nous dire la vérité. Il avait euh, une immense curiosité ajoutée à son, son côté d'infatigable globetrotter, ça en faisait un, un critique particulièrement informé et surtout c'est quelqu'un qui restait très très libre et extrêmement généreux aussi et euh, j'en terminerai par là en fait euh, nous, nous bénéficions encore de son action grâce au palais de Tokyo à Paris c'est quand même lui et Orlando pourrait en parler mieux que moi c'est quand même lui qui a euh, créé le palais de Tokyo qui est à l'origine du palais de Tokyo et il l'a fait avec beaucoup de générosité en passant en quelque sorte le témoin à une génération nouvelle et en particulier Nicolas Bourriot qui ont pu grâce à lui grâce à son appui être les, les, les directeur de cette structure qui continue uh, maintenant avec Jean Loisy. Uh, voilà, je m'arrêterai là, je sais que d'autres ont des choses passionnantes à dire sur uh, Pierre Estagny. Ce qui était très touchant euh, de, de Pierre Estagny pour euh, une artiste comme moi, c'est qu'en fait, dans le board uh, du Palais de Tokyo, uh, il a voulu absolument like qu'il we y ait beaucoup we d'artistes qui soient dans le board uh, et qui puissent uh, intervenir to meet dans l'institution. Et ça, c'est effectivement so that they can, très, très rare. Uh, Donc, il avait choisi uh, Daniel Buren, uh, 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 Raymond Hans et moi, pour être uh, dans le board. Voilà, je trouvais que c'était une ouverture d'esprit fantastique. Part of all of uh, these activities, so this was really an open spirit of his, which was really fantastic. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Raphael, that, uh, Raphael for uh, that uh, immediate entree en matière, which I think sets the scene very well for a very large personality. And, and of course, we have a wide range of topics to consider, and we have some uh, marvelous speakers here. Uh, we, we all have to exercise a little bit of self-discipline. That starts with me, because there, there are a lot of people who have a lot to say in a fairly short time. But I'm really delighted to welcome uh, the speakers on this panel, uh, starting, uh, simply if I may go from left to right, with Susanna Vatasova, uh, who knew, uh, in fact, everyone, I think, on this table knew uh, Pierre Restani fairly well. So there are some live uh, testimonies, and, and Susanna, Uh, knew him from the late 1980s, I think, onwards, and worked with him also as director of the National Gallery in Bratislava, and has written about her uh, experiences with, with Pierre Estany. Uh, I'm very particularly, we are all, I think, very particularly honored that Alex Mlinarczyk, uh, on, on Susanna's left, uh, is among us today, because he, uh, I will say something about this later, is one of the artists who was closest to Pierre, and, and I think really, in a way, provided Pierre with a key to how he should develop his subsequent career, as I will explain. But Alex has come specially from Paris yesterday to be with us. He flies back to Paris today because he already had plans to drive down to Slovakia, 1,500 kilometers, on Thursday. 
Uh, so you see, he really has made an exceptional effort to be with us, and, and we should all be very happy and, and very thankful that Alex is, is with us. Uh, Raphael, I, I didn't uh, introduce you, is of course the president of, of ICA France and, and has uh, introduced us in this marvelous way with that short video. On my right, I'm very happy indeed uh, that we have Henri Perrier, who has uh, written the most uh, marvelous, full and colorful uh, biography of, about a very colorful and a very full friend whom he knew over many years and, I believe, and has just produced this uh, new book, which is, uh, is it a re-edition or uh, it's, it's an up-to-date of, uh, of, of the biography. So here is the new book, that, the new biography that Henri Perrier has produced. Uh, and we're very grateful to have him here as well from Paris. And uh, further right is Jean-Marc uh, Poinceau. I needn't introduce to you at all, but Jean-Marc was the initiator of a major symposium which he and uh, Nicolas Bourriot and Richard Lehmann and I organized in Paris about uh, seven years ago or something uh, on Pierre and Restani, which uh, resulted in this uh, book of proceedings uh, which is in French, which was published and brought together 20 or 30 scholars and people, uh, personal test witnesses to, uh, to, to uh, Pierre Estany's life and activities. And on the far right, I, I was going to say we're going to concentrate, at least I'm going to start with a probably rather dry, short paper, uh, but introducing Pierre Estany to this world, but we'll end by elaborating a little bit his uh, wider connections with Lisbeth Reboyo Gonzalez, uh, who I think will speak a little bit about Pierre Restani in, uh, in Brazil. We could have other people talking about Pierre Restani in the Far East, in Israel, in any part of the world you'd like to mention, but uh, that's what we have for the moment. So if you uh, will allow, I, I will start with a, with a short paper because I want to pin... Uh, Pierre Estany, a little bit his activities in, in this part of the world, and specifically in relation to AICA and to the role that AICA played and Pierre Estany played in opening up the dialogue uh, with uh, both uh, Czechoslovakia and, incidentally, with Poland uh, during the, the uh, hardest times of the Cold War, perhaps, or certainly during the 1960s. So I'll start without further ado, and I'll, I'll read relatively fast, if I may. Uh, Pierre Estény's involvement with artists in Eastern Europe in the 1960s was particularly intense and may be regarded as significant for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, for the confidence he gave to a new generation of artists that there was a potential audience for their work and that they were not necessarily condemned, as their predecessors had been, to isolation, compromise, or inner emigration. Pierre was a well-connected critic and curator from the West, and from what was still regarded in Eastern Europe until well past the 1960s, as we heard yesterday, as the artistic capital of the world, who took a serious interest in their work at first hand, and who took the trouble to examine the social and cultural context which gave rise to it. Here, too, was a messenger who represented an artistic movement in Paris that was of growing international significance. I'm speaking of the nouveau realisme, of course, and even of relevance to those in socialist countries, such as Gomulka's Poland and Dubček's Czechoslovakia, that were experiencing a temporary loosening of ideological controls and even the modest stirrings of a consumer-orientated economy. Here, too, was an influential thinker and actor in the cultural field who was demonstrably independent of governmental and institutional ties. Notably, the um, Palais de Tokyo, I think, was his only institutional commitment uh, later in life. And who was anxious to take art out into the open, into direct confrontation with ordinary everyday life, the new urban context, and areas of social interaction that were meaningful to a younger generation who were fed up with the diet of ideologically tinged utopianism. Restani subsequently maintained his connections with East Europe as best he could, but his action there in those years, in the 60s, show at the clearest the basic impulses behind his activities as a whole in their purest form. The leap into East Europe was a leap into the unknown. 
um, as a, into the unknown as an itinerant critic and curator uh, that helped him to determine the pattern of his existence over the next 40 years. Much credit for this must also be due to the professional dedication of his colleagues in international ICO, who played a key role in keeping open the channels of communication between visual arts professionals at a level which managed to stay just below the reach of the political radar of the ideological control towers. The ICO Congress in Poland in 1960, which was referred to by Marek, was something of a first. The Archive de la Critique d'Art in Rennes, uh, presided over by Jean-Marc Poinceau, uh, preserved Restany's typescript, uh, typescript report of the events there. The Congress was attended by a surprisingly high total of around 50 participants in all, approximately half of them Polish, and the remainder comprising a number from West European countries, including Jacques Lassagne and, and Pierre Essany from France, three from the United States, uh, including uh, James Johnson Sweeney, the current international president of the association, Dore Ashton and Annette Ma Michelson, three each from Brazil and Yugoslavia, one from Ceylon, as it was, Sri Lanka, Egypt, and Mexico, and as many as five from the neighboring Czechoslovakia, including the performance artist Milan Knizak. The, um, the Polish uh, president, uh, Julius Staszynski, had been largely responsible for developing the principal theme for debate, the institutional character of contemporary art and the roles of the different national milieu in the formation of their art and he'd given careful consideration to the matter, for it was he who had curated the official Polish contribution to the gigantic exhibition of art of socialist in, uh, countries in Moscow at the end of 1958, where an abstract by Jan Marszynski in particular, referred to uh, yesterday by uh, Piotr, had created a scandal, and the Soviet authorities had condemned the display as a, quote, a treacherous denial of socialist ideologists uh, ideology and aesthetics. <coughs> After the end of the Congress in Warsaw, Restani would go, uh, uh, went first to Krakow, Krakow to see the um, theatre director, Tadeusz Kando, Kanto, as we think of him now, but who was then much better known as the leading, um, leading representative of, in Poland of Art Informel. And from there he went to Łódź to see Richard Stanislavski, the director of the Museum Stuki, and the latter's first wife, the sculptor Alina Zapochnikov, uh, who was, uh, has only recently perhaps received, begun to receive the international fame and exposure that she deserves. The Ninth Congress in Czechoslovakia, which Restani <coughs> attended, and which took place from September the 25th to October the 2nd, 1966, in Prague and Bratislava, was thoroughly prepared in advance by the context that had been building up between artists and critics on both sides of the Iron Curtain since the beginning of the 1960s. And the Czech representation itself had been swollen by the election to the association the previous year of no fewer than 11 new members from Czechoslovakia, including Hassani's friend, the critic Jindrich Cherupetsky. In the preliminary discussions for Prague at the previous year's Congress in Paris, the Czechoslovak president, Miroslav Mitsko, outlined his section's plans for an exhibition of modern Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak art, with particular emphasis on the contribution that the country's artists had made to the European surrealist movement, um, by implication up to the time of the communist takeover in 1948 and for the main theme of the discussion, uh, which would concentrate on, I quote, the specifics of different art forms and the integration of the arts, with a sub-theme devoted to art criticism at the suggestion of the Regional Secretary for East Europe, uh, Julius Staszynski, no less, and specifically an attempt to define the functions of criticism, the competences and function of the critic, and very significantly, the problems and responsibilities of freedom. The Congress on this occasion was attended by a similar range of international delegates to those who had taken part in the Warsaw event in 1960, though with the addition of representatives from the new East German and Romanian sections, 
and for the first time significantly an observer from the USSR. Uh, Restani uh, uh, gave, delivered a short paper on sociological considerations in the formation of a critic. One individual who had sought, has sought out Restani in Paris only shortly before the conference in Czechoslovakia was the young uh, Czechoslovak artist Alex Mlinarczyk. And Restani's um, prolonged, the first prolonged stay in Czechoslovakia for this conference marked the beginning of a lifelong friendship and collaboration between the two men. This launched what Czarupeski referred to as the Slovak, uh, quote, Slovak branch of new realism, leading to the manifesto Hapsok, published jointly on the 1st of May, 1965, with the sculptor Stano Filko and art historian Zita Kostrova, and, and of course Minaci, and providing the pretext for a number of more or less bold and more or less serious public actions and performances in Slovakia. When the conference moved to Bratislava after Prague on the 2nd of October 1966, Mlinacic enlisted Restani and Michel Ragon in a conspiracy to take part in a performance in protest against, uh, uh, to the, against the authorities for having substituted an exhibition of naive paintings for a previously arranged exhibition of, of Czechoslovak artists, which had been sent off to Brno instead, where nobody from abroad would see it. And I think we might hear about more uh, of this later. Um, Restani's public collaboration with Milinacic reached a climax and a conclusion with Milinacic's largest and most ambitious festival, Eve's Wedding, the Mariage Dev, on the 27th of uh, September 1972 in Zidina where Yindrich Czarupetsky was the best man to the bride and Restani one of the dozen or so officiants. Looking back in 1974 at a time when public orthodoxy had fully reasserted itself and normalization, as it was called, was in full swing, the very official Czechoslovak Union of Artists, which had already expelled Mlinacic by then, issued an ad hoc proclamation in favor of socialist art, it, it said, in favor of socialist art, which explicitly states that, and I quote, the 1966 AICA Congress turned into a propaganda exercise for decadent ideas associated with bourgeois art of the West. Alex Mlinarczyk's what they called permanent manifestation arrived just at the right time and was very well received by the foreign participants, by the foreign participants. Behind all the badinage, however, there were serious issues at stake. Restani's relations with the artistic scene in Czechoslovakia had flourished throughout this period from around 1964 when uh, Yuzhi Shetlik, the former critic of Rude Pravo, was appointed director of the State Publishing House in Prague and invited Restani to collaborate on a regular basis as the Paris correspondent for the weekly Vitani Prace and the monthly Vitani Umeni. This continued till 1972. During this period, Milinacic relates, and he can tell us more, Restani would come and spend his summer holidays in Slovakia, seeing his friends, living like a king, on the proceeds of his soft currency earnings as a critic for the Prague publications. During this period, too, he was in close contact with other Czechoslovak friends, such as Yindrich uh, Czarupetsky, who on 21st of April 1968, not long before the Soviet invasion, proposed to him an exhibition of Nouveau Realiste at the size of Spala Gallery in Prague, but also the critic Gigi, uh, Gigi, Gigi Padrita, the editor of the two periodicals he worked for, and a specialist in constructivism cinema who had, I quote from a letter, the extreme civility to lend me his bed and his wife during my initial stays there. This was Padrita writing from Bochum, i.e. outside Czechoslovakia and uh, talking about the sad state of the world. We are savoring this new Slovak freedom on a note of bitterness and anxious to see whether this newborn baby is going to be allowed to keep its amusing new plaything or whether the toy is going to be put back into the fridge. It's astonishing how many Democrats this Czech na nation suddenly has one day to the next. All the old Stalinist fraternity are wearing smiles like wild time and attack us for smiling back in a less progressive way. Shit, yet this is what Le Monde calls an unprecedented experiment. 
I think I should probably stop there. I could go on uh, to describe a little bit afterwards if we have time. Uh, the Congress in Poland in 1976 when uh, Restani was elected onto AICA's administrative council. But I think that's, uh, that's probably enough for me and too much. So I'd really like to hand the um, microphone, if I may, to uh, Bon, donc je vais dire quelques mots sur les archives de la critique d'art. Ok, so now I will say a few words regarding the archives of the uh, art criticism of Pierre Restani. Well, uh, Restani was one of the people who enabled uh, art critics to develop uh, their activities because he was uh, very well aware of the textual, of the importance of the textual documents for the understanding of the entire understanding of the entire uh, world of art of the uh, second half of the 20th century. He started writing uh, these archives in 1989 and the last word uh, joined to these archives by the family was uh, in January of this year. All these documents uh, represent uh, 500 um, linear meters, in other words, tens of thousands of texts, documents, photographies, uh, photographs, sorry, uh, 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 notes on exhibitions, on uh, meetings with artists, different folders, uh, pictures from meetings with other colleagues, art critics, everything that really forms part of uh, uh, the important uh, moments in the life of an artist uh, in, uh, during a period of 50 years. So this uh, collection of his is uh, indeed very important because he decided he would include in that collection everything that ever uh, came uh, through his uh, hands, so to speak, during his uh, journalistic activities. And uh, when he uh, contacted an artist who gave him his catalog or business card, Card, or, or a picture or maybe some letters, all of these can be found in these uh, folders. For example, as regards uh, photos, uh, here we can find all the photos, all the pictures from exhibitions which uh, enable us to, uh, those of us who currently are interested in the history of exhibitions, to uh, gain access to first uh, or top-notch uh, quality material. Uh, as regards correspondence, this includes tens of thousands of letters which he exchanged with artists. For example, you can find letters which uh, Pierre Restani wrote to Alex Mlinarczyk uh, and also letters which uh, were sent back to him. Of course, only those which uh, managed to get through uh, censorship and which uh, found him in Paris. Uh, so this was correspondence from the entire world. And then uh, Pierre Restani also wrote a letter to a number of personalities uh, who were either uh, uh, businessmen, uh, art traders, uh, other critics, museum directors, and so on. And uh, all these letters uh, were uh, written uh, by him as if he was uh, writing a, a magazine article, a journal article, and a big part of this, uh, cor of this correspondence is, uh, has been unknown uh, until uh, recently. Uh, we uh, continue uh, to have a lot of documents which have not been published, which can still be published uh, regarding uh, different uh, countries, uh, different experts, uh, and uh, we also have people coming from other countries uh, coming to uh, study the documents of uh, Pierre Restani so that they can use uh, these primary materials in their own research. Uh, Pierre Restani was not only the creator of new realism and uh, uh, an international expert, but he was also 
a uh, strong defender of the artistic scene, first of all in the more general uh, understanding uh, of uh, this expression, because this went not only for, uh, this was not only true in the case of uh, visual arts, uh, but, uh, fine arts, but he was also interested in uh, new media, new technologies, and he also uh, tried to include this all in a wider technological uh, approach. I, uh, we continue to think that the question of this sociological approach of new realism is uh, really uh, something which was discovered, or we tend to think that this was sort of discovered by uh, by Restani or invented by Restani, but really he was impressed by Jordani's analysis. He was in a way a follower of uh, his steps and he really found himself in this uh, idea. Uh, as regards the uh, question of methodology of art history. So Restani was a uh, expert, a theoretical expert. He was a person uh, who was interested in methodology related to art history, but at the same time he was also an observer of uh, art policy. And uh, we should uh, know that a big part of uh, his work uh, consisted of uh, support uh, by very conservative people in the late 50s and early 60s. For example, uh, Mate, who was a uh, sort of spiritual father of the Centre Pompidou and who uh, tried to also support the French artistic uh, scene uh, in this very uh, period of time when the Ministry of Culture had some uh, problems with assigning financial resources for this type of activities within uh, society. So all of these are elements which you can discover in his correspondence and these really are documents which are uh, very impressive. You can use them, you can uh, use them as a uh, source of inspiration, you can use them for practical purposes and uh, uh, you can use them to help yourself uh, uh, with the publication of your own articles uh, so that you can understand the history of art in the second uh, half of the 20th century. Thank you. And uh, now we have Henri uh, Perrier, uh, who takes the floor <coughs> next. Yes, thank you uh, very much. I would just like to say a few words uh, in French first. I would like to say that... Uh, in my uh, short presentation, I have uh, three different parts. The first part uh, describes this uh, process uh, uh, because when I started writing this uh, biography uh, some 20 years ago, everybody who I met, uh, everybody who was uh, who surrounded Pierre Stani was asking me, why would you want to uh, write a biography of his? They were really full of doubts. And uh, today, uh, 10 years after his death, uh, in 2003, well, we already are in 2013, uh, suddenly people, or many people anyway, are telling me, why don't you publish uh, this biography again? Why don't you do a new edition? So this would be the first part, the whole process. Then in the second part, we will talk about the uh, amazing performance uh, by Alex Mlinarczyk because he, uh, he traveled all the way from uh, Paris uh, to be with us today, uh, to this, uh, uh, to be present with us, uh, this honor to be arrested, and then we will talk about the uh, history and its importance. Occasion. One night, I sat uh, facing him at the same table. Uh, I seized the opportunity and asked him, "Do you know Pierre Restani?" He answered me, "Yeah, of course. He's a myth." So, uh, when some somebody like uh, Andy Varol tells you that uh, French are critic is a myth, well, you can easily understand that I was very impressed. And this was the starting point of my serious interest in uh, Pierre Estany. Of course, I knew that on October 27, 1960, Pierre Estany found the new realism. Yves Klein, Armand, Jean Tinguely, Raymond Hens, Jacques Villeglet, Daniel Spoeri, François Dufresne, Marcel Reis signed the manifesto of the new realism. These artists are unknown. César would also be anointed by Pierre Restani as a new realist. He was the only one to be already known at that time. Christo, Mimorotella, Deschamps, and Niki de Saint-Fal, John Venn, a host of artists 
now acknowledged by the history of art and the market. Behind all these fabulous adventures, a man built his theory and contributed by his action and writings to impose these artists in the world. I knew also that Yves Klein was passionately championed during his short career by Pierre Estani. The artist received, in fact, total and unconditional support from the critic. The documentation that can be found about Yves Klein shows that the introductions, maybe except one or two, to the exhibitions were always written by Pierre Estani. So the more I learned, the more I, I, I understood that the role of Pierre Estani outstripped the action of a classical art critic, or at least that the idea I had at that time about that kind of activity. So as not to forget anything, I must also say that at the same period, I read a copy of Domus, the Italian magazine of architecture and design, in which Pierre Restani spoke about the neuralism festival in Milan. I note in this essay some elements of Restani's thought. I discover a real theoretical thinking associated to a vision, but likewise a polemical tone. His statement gave the art world the appearance of a battlefield. For example, he wrote, in three years, the new realism, realists bump off the informal movement and burst the anachronistic myth of the School of Paris, restored the vital links of the, with American avant-garde. Without its protectionist dam in Paris, the cultural <coughs> hegemony of Paris is dead. This belligerent and polemical tone weighted my curiosity. I remember Friday, April 3, 1992, West Broadway in New York. I am in the office of Leo Castelli, the prominent art dealer of the second half of the 20th century. I have an interview with him on Restani that exceeds my expectations. For him, at least, there is no doubt. Restani is one of the most important figures of the cultural life in France. He even regretted that Pierre Restani had never be appointed Minister of Culture. I met Pierre Restani for the first time in December 1989, to be precise, at the Hotel Manzoni in Milan. I had come there with an artist to present a project. During the meeting, I was very impressed by his, his judgment and overall by his theoretical inductions he, that he immediately communicated to the artist. I also realized that I had in front of me an exceptional character and I noted his celebrity in Italy. So at this stage, I am in contact with a French art critic, a myth, according to Andy Varol, who has created a movement that is going to make its mark art history, from whom Leo Castelli has great admiration, who has still its place in the history of 20th century and whose role is unknown in France. I remember very well the letter I received from Yves Berger in person, the powerful publisher of Grasset, who refused my manuscript because Restani was, according to him, totally unknown in France. If I especially insist on the, on the genesis of my biography, it's to highlight the fact that the intuitions I gather along this long journey have been confirmed beyond my expectations. Issues that can be found in my book and their conclusions or findings went further that, than I had felt intuitively at the beginning. I can say that I have not been disappointed. Actually, this five-year investigation has been very successful. Could the new realism have exist, existed without Pierre Restani? This question is one of the central points of my book. The answer, of course, is no. My book is about a man's obsession, a man with an exceptional intelligence. I have to say that some artists, big name today, would not have the same place in the art history if Restani had not been there with his genius and stubbornness. I am, for example, as already I heard, convinced that César would not have presented his compressions, 
In any case, after the big scandal at the Salon in May 1960, when he showed three compressed cars and everything collapsed around him, if Restani had not supported him during five years, when everyone turned their back, Caesar would have abandoned once and for all the compression and this was a face of art, l'autre face de l'art. My investigation obliged me to say also that without Restani, Yves Klein would never had the influence he has had. And I will go further, I may shock you, but I, I do think that without Restani, there might not have been any Yves Klein. But I do not have here only what is called the intimate conviction of the judge. I, I, am, I am not the only one who thinks that. I rely on several testimonials from persons who have closely followed this project since its inception. I think of our critics like Michel Ragon, Pierre Descargues, Pierre Caban, Otto Hahn, or artists like Paolo Valors or Gianni Bertini. I also think of Eliane Radig, Armand's first wife, Aline, the first wife of Restani, or the second, Janine, who opened the Gallery J to provide visibility for the artist from her husband def defended. The philosopher of art also offered a theoretical passport to many artists. And this is very important because we know that many artists doubt. I cannot, cannot help speaking also about its influence on Italian design. I'm thinking spe especially on Alessandro Mendino or Andrea Branzi, or some specialists of public art like Danny Caravan, who told me, like uh, the two Italians, that meeting Restani was the best thing that happened in, in their lives. One must speak also about what he did in Brazil. In, in June 1992, the critic was invited to the biggest environmental event of all time in Rio. When he went there with two Brazilian artists on the main northern tributary of the Amazon, he wrote the Manifesto of Rio Negro. That was in 1978 and was followed by the many stormy conferences. But there, there is also Restani at the forefront. The ideas he championed or at that time, at this time, are in line with with the concern of Brazilian today. Restani is a visionary again. It seems that I have a problem, no? <laughs> no? I show in my biography the fame and notoriety of Restani in the whole world. I do not hesitate to use the term of alchemist or guru. The mouse may sound exaggerated, but this is the reality I have found in my experience with him during the many trips we have met together. This is how Pierre Restani is seen by the artist. His creation, among others, is a French movement preceding pop art. A propos, we might add that actually he was a French critic who set up with Sidney Janis the first pop exhibition in New York in autumn 1962, the title of which was The New Realism. Well, it seems that everyone has forgotten this exhibition as if they wanted to rewrite history. But beware, Restani should not be appreciated and seen, even though that is quite a lot, only in terms of neuralism, but, al but also by his writings and manifestos. I quote, for example, the Rio Negro manifesto written in the Amazon showing his awareness of ecological problems in South America. The three thinker can speak through his own history, the history of the other face of art, l'autre face de l'art. He is one of the few who can read contemporary art history and say that without him, all would not have been like that. There also appear in my biography the fame and notoriety of Brestani in the rest of the world, in Spain, Italy, Germany, Eastern Europe, 
the United States, Korea, Japan, and in, South, in the South American continent, Argentina and Brazil, where its action le has left its marks. Well, concerning Eastern Europe, how could we not speak today here in Kozice about the first day of Borestani in the country called in 1966 Czechoslovakia? I must now, of course, mention the meeting of Restani with the Slovakian artist Alex Mlinarsik. At that time, Mlinarsik made a special trip to meet the French art critic. This meeting and his stay in Paris made him un understand that his painting, which we watched close to the informal movement, belonged to the past. Restani arrived for the first time in Prague on September 25th. 1966, accompanied by his Italian colleague Argan, to attend the Congress of the AICA. This mixture of high culture, baroque architecture, and the beauty of Prague, as well as the totalitarian regime on this jewel of the Vatava, put Restani in a special mood. At that time, Restani was well known for his personal scandals as well as for his position of an art critic. He liked to shock his colleagues, whom he sometimes judged to reserve by his careless attitude. All Congress participants go to Bratislava. They have to attend a series of interventions. The recent friendship <coughs> with Mlinashik would be a pretext for Restani to make a singular action. The artist had, had realized that what was happening in Paris. He has approached the concept of the deviant object line and the show action of the new realism, les actions spectacles du nouveau réalisme. His role in the Prague Spring and after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia was very, to, be, to be very important. Anyway. Mlinarsik is now primarily interested in happenings and performances. The Czech authorities have prepared the Congress with the utmost seriousness. Exhibitions are planned in Prague and Bratislava. Of course, the artists of the country want to show their work to the art, the art critics. In Bratislava, the exhibition is for naive painters. Young people are invited to exhibit in Bro, the capital of Moravia. Alex Minarchi is furious because he knows that that foreigner will not, will not make this long trip. He gets angry and refuses to participate. He decides to make his own action, actually a counter event, and one Restani who gives his consent. The artist simply rents municipal toilets from the center square of the city, boosting the title of assistant to the School of Fine Arts, he appeared in a suit at the police station. He says he wants to investigate and do a sociological test in public toilets. Not wanting to provoke the authorities, he asks the police chief to provide force <laughs> forces to prevent disorder. Three hotels welcome people to the Congress in Bratislava. The organization is perfect. All participants have got in their room an invitation from the company of the artist with the program of the day. Linarchi has also put an invitation for his personal event in every room. The official event takes place at 10 a.m. So does the event of the Slovakian artist. At this time, the urban square in Bratislava is invited by a crowd of foreigners which attract a congregation of passers-by. Restani, together with Michel Ragon, the French art critic, has convinced most of his colleagues, many world-ranking critics, to go to the event of Mlinarchik. He cuts the, the cord and makes a formal speech. The artist has placed several mirrors in homage to Ma Marcel Duchamp and other personalities in the urinals. The critics urinate to, to the Radeski March by Johann Strauss. There, under the castle of Maria Theresa of Austria, which dominates the city, critics lend Ventham to the right established by the artist. They cheerfully autograph a great book on the small table at the entrance 
of an unusual place for an artist, artistic event. The scandal is huge. The officials are ashamed in the presence of invited politicians. Restani and his wife flee the city. Mlinarji has still time to show them the mountains and the Gothic, the Gothic splendors. The press insults the artist who becomes a sulfurous personality. So now, I invite you to stand up and to applaud Milenarchi, whose performance was a very important moment, in my view, a key date in the history of the art of Eastern European countries. Well, to return to my biography, if I change the title, The Alchemist of Art for the Prophet of Art, it is that the idea of the prophet, in the most common sense, that is to say one who predicts the future, could also be used when talking about Restani. We have to read attentively Restani theoretical test, text. I recommend, for example, La Nouvelle Aventure de l'Objet, the second manifesto of New Realism, at 40 degrees au-dessus de Dada, the third, third manifesto, Munich, 1963, the first two prefaces of for Yves Klein, La Minute de Vérité et l'Epoca Blue, Le Nouveau Realisme à Paris et à New York, L'autre face de l'art, 60-90, 30 ans de Nouveau Realisme, Yves Klein, Le Feu au cœur du vide, Les Objets Plus, and the interview he wrote for the exhibition Les Nouveaux Realistes at the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris in 1986. Le Livre Blanc et le Livre Rouge, bien sûr, le Manifeste du Rio Negro, et aussi, ailleurs, the text he wrote for the monograph of Alex, Alex Minarchik in 1994, where he speaks, among other things, of the, of the extraordinary adventure, this imaginary kingdom they imagined together. Actually, the critic announced the ideas of the coming decade and the beginning of this century. As a matter of fact, Restani invent, invented not only a movement, but also the conceptual tools that allow us to understand the art of today. We realize this, especially when he speaks of the self-expressive autonomy of the object, object l'autonomy expressive de, 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 de l'objet ou de, du réel, l'autonomie expressive du réel aussi, which are, as he said, parts of the great republic of our social exchanges, our trade company. Restani has shown us how to establish a vocabulary from the ready-made. The new realism is Dada not seen as an end in itself, but as a tool. As Nicolas Bourriot, the French critic, said, this is really one of the most impressive theoretical coup de force of the 20th century. For Estani, art was not just a series of, of, of objects, but a real conceptual apparatus for be, a better understanding of our world. One has to mention that Restani opened not only the debate on ecology in Brazil, but also the consideration of subculture in search of their identity. The Manifesto of Rio Negro was, as Harry Bellet wrote it say in the French newspaper Le Monde, a true eco-ethnological advocacy. This idea would reluctantly appear in the manners of contemporary art about 10 years later. I, can, I have to add the extraordinary human dimension of the character because with my biography, I wish to present Restani as a person, a creator, and not only as a crossroads of force, forces and abstractions. Pierre Restani <coughs> is as important in the 20th century as characters like Andy Warhol and Joseph Beuys. And my dearest wish is that this biography might have been able to recreate the universe of Restani because it does exist in his manifold correspondence. 
a man who settled on our criticism, not as a profession, but as a lifestyle, an art he has raised, in any case, to its highest degree of nobility and intelligibility. Merci, Henri. C'était euh, absolument fascinant. Je vais, je vais tout de suite passer le micro. Uh, thank you, Henri. That was fascinating. And now the next speaker will be uh, Mr. Alex Mlinarczyk, so that he can say a few words uh, and respond uh, to this uh, amazing uh, Dionysian speech, so to speak. Bonjour. Uh, une fois. J'ai venu chez Pierre et je lui ai dit, écoute. Uh, hello, uh, one day I came to Pierre and I uh, told him, uh, listen, I decided I want to learn French, but I really want to learn to speak French. And he told me, Alex, don't even do it because uh, uh, you will lose all of your charm, you know. And so I have to apologize. Uh, my French is sort of a Slovak French or even Bulgarian French, if I'm uh, being totally honest. And I would like to thank uh, for all the words uh, which have uh, now been addressed uh, to me uh, regarding my life, regarding my relationship with uh, Pierre Erestani. I uh, was happy enough to I was privileged enough to uh, share 39 years uh, with him. I knew him until his death, and it was an amazing uh, time. It was really a dream come true for me personally. I came to Paris uh, for the first time in 1964, so this was uh, four years after the creation, uh, the first creation of a new realism of this group. And uh, as you uh, know uh, very well, this turned into something uh, quite uh, spectacular. Then, of course, the revolution came in 1968. But when I came to Paris uh, for the first time, it was because for me it was a, an appropriate moment. Uh, it was uh, a time when the second wave of new realism was being formed, and we were uh, somewhat uh, um, influenced by classical realists on the one hand. And on the other hand, we were also partly uh, influenced uh, by uh, well-known American artists and perhaps uh, Walter Fos uh, Foster as well, the German artist, a little bit. And uh, we, uh, uh, you can also find the gestures of Alan Keprov in uh, uh, this uh, type of uh, art which are somehow hard as the entire uh, German art, uh, so to speak. But this really opens up a, a big uh, road for us to uh, move forward in our ideas of new realism in the 1960s. And then we started with uh, something which uh, we now call performance art or active art or happenings uh, back then. And art critics uh, in general, unfortunately, have the tendency to always uh, find a little box, a little category where everything needs to be uh, put or placed. And unfortunately, I do not quite agree with this approach because uh, an action, a performance, these are just uh, sort of descriptions uh, of what's going on. But what uh, we really uh, live, what we really experience is something different. And uh, just uh, this machine or a tool for gestures, this is something that you uh, find with the public, with the audience. Uh, for example, uh, when I speak, I can only speak to myself, but it is very important for me to communicate to communicate with others, uh, to talk to others. Based on my experience, I already said that I am no guru. Uh, I am trying to always uh, create uh, contacts uh, with other people. I uh, always prepare my actions, my performances for others for people, for the public. I always want the audience to be there, to participate and to help me create these works of art. 
In uh, most cases, perhaps 80% of these uh, uh, performances of these actions uh, were uh, co-created in cooperation with uh, the public, with the audience. And this, I think, is the most important uh, influence that Pierre Restani had on me personally. He was not only a professor, he managed to create an amazing atmosphere uh, everywhere he was. And uh, in this way, he uh, uh, managed to uh, sort of break up the classical Paris school, which exa existed beforehand. And um, which uh, was at this period of time uh, going uh, in a declining uh, direction, so to speak. And uh, he created a group of associated artists coming from all parts of the world. Uh, I remember very well this amazing moment when uh, we met uh, by coincidence in a bistro or somewhere else in Paris or maybe uh, in other uh, places, uh, maybe uh, there was a Chinese man with him or an American or a Swedish man or an Italian. We didn't even know who was uh, from which country when we met. But what we knew for sure was that each one of us was uh, contributing something specific. And uh, we knew very well that uh, the Japanese uh, are very characteristic, that uh, people from Latin America also had their own very specific character. And I was uh, lucky enough uh, in my life to be able to also present uh, the spirit of our small country, of Slovakia. Uh, in the end, uh, this was a country, or this is a country which is located or used to be located on the border between the Byzantine Empire and the Western world. And uh, therefore, this is uh, also something you can find uh, in our religion. This is uh, what you can find in Slovakia. You have uh, uh, the Orthodox Church in Slovakia, which is the Eastern aspect. And then, of course, the rest of Slovakia uh, is uh, Protestants, and especially Catholics. Uh, but uh, every uh, revision uh, brings uh, with it a specific uh, atmosphere. Y you know that the Orthodox, Orthodox religion is well known for their music, for their candles, uh, for their very specific atmosphere uh, during service. And Slovakia really is a country which was on the frontier between these two empires. And Pierre Restani uh, experienced all of this with his own eyes. He, he lived through it and he saw it uh, very, uh, very vividly. He was a big friend of Czechoslovak art and especially Slovak art. And his personality uh, very much influenced the progress we uh, saw in our country. Zuzana, of course, will uh, tell you more about this, about what uh, happened after his first visit in our country in uh, 1966 when Restani came to Slovakia uh, for the first time. He was the only Western art critic who visited us and who would uh, come again and again. Every year he would come to Slovakia. He would travel uh, across Slovakia. And I can tell you, maybe he knows our country better than many Slovakians themselves. And uh, unfortunately, as you heard, uh, I uh, personally was not uh, very much loved by the political regime back then. And uh, in 1972, uh, four years after the uh, Soviet invasion in our country, the political uh, powers uh, or the political power was held by uh, people who were supporters of uh, Brezhnev. And the atmosphere that they created in our country was uh, very heavy. It was uh, really uh, something close to a heavy dictatorship. And therefore, in 1972, uh, Pierre Restani was uh, uh, described as a persona non grata for Czechoslovakia, and borders were close to him completely. Completely, and he was only able to come back to Czechoslovakia or Slovakia after the political changes in 1989. 
What can I say uh, by way of conclusion? Life with Pierre Restani was amazing. It was full of colors uh, because uh, he was not only a professor, a teacher. He was also a friend. He was a very kind-hearted, uh, generous, uh, gentle friend. He was never uh, really an art critic as such. He never criticized excessively. He never said, what you do is uh, total nonsense. N he never did that. Even if he saw just one little thing uh, which uh, for others, um, uh, which, uh, or rather, if he saw something that he didn't like, he preferred not to speak at all. Uh, he would say what sadness may be, but he wouldn't go any further than that. But on the contrary, if he saw something in a work of art which uh, he found fascinating, which was fresh, which was new, then he was almost like a small boy, like a little boy. He was. It was such a source of joy for him personally to discover something new in art uh, and to tell others uh, that uh, uh, what you created is something amazing, something, something glorious. And uh, in this way, we uh, spent a lot of years together. I never exhibited in Czechoslovakia until today, because the program of uh, Pierre Restani, his exhibitions all over the world, uh, in Japan, in Brazil, in New York, uh, in Australia, this was uh, a life that was uh, really full of non-stop activities, of exhibitions. Uh, I remember all these uh, great opportunities, all these events, and it was really a great life. And uh, for me, Pierre Restani is a, is a real father figure, a spiritual father, a source of... Uh, inspiration, a great source of everything that I talked about now. Okay, so I will not uh, uh, bore you anymore, but perhaps if I may, I will just add one little thing. Please let us uh, maybe stay silent for a minute. Let us enjoy a minute of uh, silence uh, in remembrance of Pierre Restani, who died 10 years ago today, uh, the, uh, this year. Bonjour, je suis ravi d'être ici. Hello, I'm very happy that I can be here today among uh, friends of uh, Pierre Restani, among a number of uh, his friends uh, from different corners of the world. I would also like to uh, thank uh, the director of ICA France, Raphael Queer, uh, who was very much interested in uh, Restani's work. Uh, and uh, it, the way I came across Restani was through Alex Miracic. And after everything that has been said here today, I can only say that uh, Restani was a man who was very friendly, who was uh, very open, who never differentiated between people who were friends of his and people who he just met, uh, such as uh, me, for example. He only met me after, or I only met him after the Velvet Revolution. I was not really a long-term friend of his, uh, but he always had some time for me. He always found uh, time uh, for an interview, whether it was in uh, Slovakia or in Paris. And except, uh, or apart from my personal uh, memories, I would only like to say the following. The influence of uh, Pierre Restani and uh, the influence he had on the uh, artistic uh, movement in the second half of the 20th century uh, was uh, really great. Uh, we already said that without Pierre Restani there would be no new realism. 
New realism wouldn't even be formed in the first place. And I can tell you that uh, Slovak art, young Slovak art, uh, not only in the second half of the uh, 20th uh, century or uh, specifically of the 1960s would not have been uh, visible for the rest of Europe if it had not been for the friendship and uh, influence of uh, Pierre Restani without his interest in Slovak art. I can only emphasize uh, to you what has already been said by Alex and uh, other speakers, but uh, we can also say that without Pierre Restani, we wouldn't have had these uh, great uh, artistic events, uh, great exhibitions which uh, formed artistic life in Slovakia and influenced it. I studied Chateau Giron myself. Uh, I went to the archives of Pierre Restani and I read uh, uh, the letters that uh, were uh, included in those boxes, in those folders, and I can tell you that he was not only interested in uh, visual artists, uh, uh, of course he also talked about his personal life, about everyday life. We have a lot of letters uh, written by artists uh, uh, to Restani who wanted to, uh, if those artists wanted to travel to Paris, so Restani would invite them, because as you can imagine, the totalitarian system in Czechoslovakia, for example, would not enable artists or art critics to travel without an official invitation. Maybe you don't even remember this, uh, or young people don't even know about this, but this is how it used to be, and he would always uh, write those invitation letters to his friends, uh, to other people. And not only this, I also found a, a big... Uh, uh, part of correspondence between uh, Lubor Kar and uh, Pierre Restani. Even in Slovakia, we did not know that all the interests and uh, contact for Lubokar, uh, whether this was uh, maybe a sculpture symposium uh, uh, for uh, sculptures made of wood or stones in the town of Pieszczany or Vizhne Ruzbachy in Slovakia, well, all these contacts, all these networks uh, uh, were uh, sort of created by Pierre Restani, and thanks to him, Lubor Kara was uh, able to contact other personalities in Europe, in the rest of the world. And it was thanks to him that uh, these great exhibitions, sculpture uh, in uh, the parks in the town of Pieszczany, well, this is one of the biggest uh, sculpture exhibitions uh, uh, of all that we have here. And uh, I found a lot of uh, letters that were written by Lubor Kara to Pierre Restani with uh, a request uh, to put him into contact with other people so that he can, uh, so that he can uh, network with others. And then uh, a, uh, an exhibition in 1968, uh, an exhibition for the young, Danubius, there were a lot of letters, a uh, lot of advice on how to organize the exhibition, different questions, answers, a uh, lot of people asked uh, Restani about this event and I do not even uh, know where he found all this time, all this energy to be so open to everybody, so friendly. Somebody who was always helpful. For me, uh, this was really something which uh, enabled Slovak art uh, to not only be hidden away from sight and unknown, because this continues uh, as a big question to this day. How do we make sure that art is not hidden? How do we make sure that art is uh, present in the public eye? And I think that this is uh, really the biggest contribution by Pierre Restani. We still have a lot of open questions which we will continue to work on so that we can find out that uh, what we already know, which is he was a big influence on Slovak art. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna, for this testimony. And uh, now we have the last speaker, Lisbeth Reboyo, who 
will uh, also uh, talk about uh, this topic. In this round table with so many uh, important people that have been thinking on uh, Rustani contribution. And uh, I myself had the opportunity of meeting him in 1998 in Buenos Aires during the ICA Congress, uh, where he, uh, he was one of the keynote speakers. And uh, later, uh, I also met him sometimes around the Biennale do Mercosul, uh, where he came and also presented us some conferences. Uh, Restani's contact with Brazil has uh, two relevant moments. The first one is in the 1960s, right after presenting his thesis about uh, new realism. This uh, moment is related to the Sao Paulo Biennials and started in 1961. However, Restani's presence becomes particularly important in two other uh, moments, in 1965 and 1969. In 1965, he begins questioning the exhibition model of the biennial presented at the time. It was organized according to the artist nationalities. The biennial gathered the artists in, the, in exhibitions areas based, based on the concepts of country of origin, creating uh, uh, what was called national representations. Uh, it was very new to, to criticize this way of organization for the time. And Restani proposed that the biennial should be organized around a concept or theme, defending that the exhibition should be built through a clear criterion to approach art in a critical way. This, uh, the debate about his idea of reformulating the uh, Sao Paulo Biennial, biennial was on all newspapers, uh, at the Brazilian newspapers at the time. Um, by observing the Sao Paulo Biennials, Restani ended up coming close to Cicillo Matarazzo, the important patron of the arts in Brazil and the founder of the Brazilian Biennial. Cicillo highly appreciated critics and listened to them. In 1967, he invited Pierre Restani to organize a special exhibition for the following biennial. He soon proposed a concept to direct the exhibit he's go he was going to, to prepare. It would be about art and technology, and it would be aligned with the issue of contemporary urban and industrial nature, which he had been discussing since the new realism. In the history of Brazil, however, the moment was not very favorable to the arts. The political scenario was extremely complicated. Since 1964, the dictatorship has, had been in place with a military government that was, become, was becoming more and more aggressive and started censoring the arts. In 1967, an exhibition in Rio de Janeiro with the representation of Brazilian artists that would be sent to the Paris Biennial was closed by the police. The Brazilian critics, Mario Pedrosa, protested against it on a Rio de Janeiro newspaper. Restani considered the fact of violence once he could not accept censorship to the arts. He defended freedom of expression and resigned the incumbency of preparing the special room for the Sao Paulo Biennial. Along with Pedrosa, they soon started organizing an international protest that materialized in the Non alla Biennale Manifesto, 
more than 300 intellectuals from all over the world signed the document. Artists gave up selling their work and there was an emptying of the 1969 biennial that became known as the Boycott Biennial. The, the second moment of uh, Restani's strong uh, critical presence in Brazil takes place in the 1970s, precisely as the colleague has said, in 1978, eight, when with two other artists from Eastern Europe who lived in Brazil, Franz Krasberg, Polish, and Sepp Banderek from Serbia, he makes an expedition through the Amazon, going down the Amazonas, Tapajós, Solimões, Jutai, and Negro rivers. That is the moment when he talks about nature, drafting the Rio Negro Manifesto, also known as Integral Naturalism Manifesto, which will also be signed by the two mentioned artists. The manifesto speaks about the Amazon as the last reserve of integral nature and poses the question between quotations. What type, of art, what type of art can be aroused by such an exorbitant environment, exceptional under all points of view? And the critic himself answers in the test, an essentialist and fundamental naturalism that opposes to na realism and uh, the very continuity of realist uh, tradition. Naturalism is presented by Restani as a subject of thought, as an ambitious program that goes well beyond ecological perspectives. It is, as he says, much more about fighting, between quotations, against subjective pollution than against objective pollution. Pollution of the senses and the brain in contrast with that of the air and water. He states, such an exceptional contest as the Amazon arouses the idea of return to original nature. Original nature should be exalted as a perception cleansing, a mental oxygen, an integral naturalism a giant catalyst and accelerator for our faculties of feeling, thinking, and acting. Brazil, through the impact of Amazon on Restani, uh, caused him a visceral aesthetic experience. So he was very much important in the production of two very relevant manifestos where he gives us some ideas about art and criticism, but also about uh, something we must think uh, on uh, because there is uh, an interesting uh, position around uh, the question of naturalism and nature uh, in this moment of the manifesto and uh, the moment of new realism. There is much to study about Restani. Thank you. I'd like to thank our last speaker, Elizabeth, very much, because that opens up so many new areas and new fields for discussion. Um, I have a quick question to you or I. We, we are more or less at coffee time, but um, maybe we have five or ten minutes if, if anyone wanted to make a comment or ask a question. Five minutes, yeah. So if, if there are a couple of, you know, say two or three quick questions or quick, quick comments that anyone would like to make. Someone uh, at the back, yes. Uh, yeah. I'd like to uh, comment uh, a little bit uh, about uh, Pierre Restani uh, relate with Korea. Uh, especially uh, 
since uh, 1988, as an Olympic game. At the time, Korean art scene uh, was very booming, uh, uh, especially the uh, contemporary art. So, centering the Fine Art Association, uh, the biggest association among the many associ art associations in Korea, uh, especially the high positioned people, uh, personally, uh, were in acquaintance with uh, Bill Restani and the many uh, relationships uh, uh, continuously. Um, so anyway, uh, personally, uh, uh, when I was uh, a presenter uh, at the ICA Congress Macau, uh, at the time, uh, Restani was moderator, and so introduced me to the all participants. And Restani, uh, I think, uh, affected very much in uh, Korean uh, contemporary art, and he uh, uh, had many relations with uh, uh, art festivals and. Um, uh, even the uh, Viennales. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, including me, now so many uh, Korean artists, uh, may I think, missed him. And uh, I uh, remind you uh, that Piero uh, Testani and the Korean contemporary art is very uh, related to each, each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jin Sup. It's uh, very interesting to hear from uh, yet another part of the world and, and the fact that Pierre Restrani was always very uh, coll collegial and he introduced you to so many colleagues in Macau uh, is I think very characteristic of his manner of acting and his relationship with, with uh, colleagues abroad. Thank you. Are there any other? Oui, j'avais une question pour uh, Henri Perrier en particulier parce que je pense que uh, yes, uh, I had a question uh, for Henri uh, because uh, this was a period of time uh, uh, for Pierre Restani which was not very well known uh, when uh, he was involved with the work of the Ministry uh, of Culture because this was a place where he learned, I think, a lot about uh, communication strategies, uh, political strategies, so that uh, later on he would be able to defend the artists he wanted to uh, promote. Yes, uh, in fact, that is very much true. Uh, his father thought that uh, Pierre should be in politics, and uh, therefore uh, uh, he uh, even was uh, uh, accepted to the uh, political science university in uh, Paris. But I think, uh, if I am not mistaken, that uh, he always made sure that he would not pass the exams. For example, there was a professor who asked him either the first time or the second round time around. He asked him, uh, what is your favorite book? And uh, Restani replied uh, uh, with the title of some uh, children's uh, book uh, or some ironic book. And they asked him, why would you mention a book like this? And he said, well, I like it because it's very ironic. And so they thought, well, maybe for government you are not really the best person. And uh, then he worked with, a, uh, with an amazing personality and Shaman Delmas, who was a minister later on. He was a big adventurer and he was also... Uh, there at the ministry uh, when uh, there was a coup d'etat in Algeria. Uh, he was uh, present there and uh, of course he was uh, more of a supporter of uh, keeping Algeria as uh, under French influence. Uh, perhaps uh, there were some others who 
uh, would have uh, understood this uh, point of view. He was one of uh, very uh, uh, few art critics who was not uh, part of the right wing. Uh, which was very interesting as well because uh, even uh, recently I went uh, to a dinner with some uh, three or four other people when I was even attacked uh, by some person who told me well how could you even write a book about this kind of person he was a right uh, winger he was, uh, he was a Nazi he was a fascist and uh, immediately I uh, thought, uh, well, maybe I'm gonna slap this person uh, in the face, uh, but then I decided not to because next to me somebody else was sitting and that other person really calmed this first person down and in a more diplomatic manner than what, than what I was envisaging but then but really I could tell that uh, there was a, a strong uh, feeling of even rage of hatred against Restani which we can still uh, feel and this was coming from people who never met him in the first place uh, these people can be very agitated uh, very irrigated uh, very uh, uh, very uh, arrogant even uh, and irritated uh, so um, I invite you to the conference, uh, Charles will be also there, you can have a look at uh, uh, the temple, Andre will also be there, but then the uh, regarding the specific question uh, that you uh, mentioned, uh, well, yes, this was uh, certainly something, his work at the ministry, which gave him two things, and I can maybe discover something or uh, tell you something new. Today I asked uh, Pierre, well, how are you working, what do you do in order to uh, uh, survive? But then he told me, uh, I will tell you a big secret, but you cannot tell uh, anyone, but of course the secret is best uh, when you can share it with somebody else, and he told me this would be a lesson for you as uh, well when uh, I left the ministry I continued to uh, <laughs> to get paid by the ministry for the next 10 years I still uh, got my salary from the ministry this is really not a joke it was it was quite serious he really told me this is not a joke I left the ministry but I was still paid 10 years later uh, France was a rich country back then uh, and you were able to pay even people who were not working for you anymore so uh, you should uh, really be happy about this if you if you tell the story to somebody uh, else you should see this as a happy story as a positive story and i'm sure that this also taught him uh, a lot about uh, the economy about how the country is uh, working so if i come back to uh, what has uh, already been said by jean marc uh, well he was very much influenced by Argen, but uh, Arman, but uh, I think that uh, he also saw the consumerism in society and that influenced him as well. He drafted a number of studies for the ministry and this was quite different from the education that he had before then. So I think this is also an important aspect of his life. So the question that you gave was very pertinent and I'm convinced that through his work at the ministry he was able to see how the real world operates. He was also a big politician really uh, because otherwise he would never have been so successful in the first place place he would never have been able to assert people to promote others this was really the biggest part of his job and I can tell you another anecdote uh, I met him at uh, dozens of conferences around the world and never did I hear anybody uh, say uh, uh, or uh, anybody who would who would gain the upper hand vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Pierre in a discussion. I uh, learned a lot from him. He could uh, talk uh, for two hours even about maybe the construction of a highway. He really had the right uh, rhetoric technique for uh, 
this type of activity. So this background that he had at the ministry, I think, was very important as well. That's a very good point to finish with that personal testimony. I, I always wondered if he sold pictures to survive, but I didn't realize that the, the secret answer was that he had a salary. <laughs> um, just before we go, I'd like to say two small things. One, one is that we are stopping uh, on the way down to Bratislava in Zirina, and that is indeed the scene of one of the actions uh, of uh, Pierre, which I mentioned, the, the mariage d'Ev, so perhaps we can talk about that later. The uh, other one is that uh, Alex Minacek has very uh, kindly said that his book, uh, Pierre Restani's book, Ayers, um, is available to anyone who'd like to buy it in the foyer uh, out, outside. Um, so I'd just like to uh, like you to join me, please, in thanking all the speakers this morning for, I think, a very interesting session. Uh, thank you to the participants of the round table. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very short 10-minute break, and then we'll start.